I am Taryn Hart. I am with Occupy Missoula, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. Uh, hi, Taryn. I have, wear a lot of hats. I'm an author. My recent book is called Age of Greed. I'm a senior fellow with Roosevelt Institute and the New School. I'm, uh, I edit a magazine called Challenge, uh, and I blog on a variety of websites, including uh, today the New York Review of Books website where I'm a regular contributor. Very good. Uh, kind of the idea of doing this was, one, you had um, done teach-ins in, at Zuccotti Park, uh, more than one, with uh, Professor Stiglitz. And I had the idea that we could perhaps record something that could be sent to the other locations who maybe can't uh, get people to come do live teach-ins. Information you think is important um, for people who are interested in the economic issues um, that are associated with this movement? Well, I think the movement's uh, instincts and uh, it, its focus are essentially correct. I think they accord with the actual facts of the matter. One percent of Americans earn nearly 20 percent of the income, and we had the worst recession we have had since the Great Depression. Are those coincidences? I don't think they are coincidences. The extreme inequality of income, by which I mean the extreme amounts of income earned at the top, were earned through taking excessive risk on Wall Street, putting therefore the economy at risk when all came tumbling down, and we are paying the price for that. The buildup we had until 2007 was based a great deal on debt, Wall Street risk-taking, and uh, that was stimulated, that was motivated by the fact that a lot of people could make a lot of money at the very top. There's an important message there. The gut instinct of this movement uh, accords with the facts. It is right. And all these groups that say, oh, uh, Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Missoula don't understand how markets work. They allowed Wall Street to function in a monopolistic way with conflicts of interest and inappropriate incentives that don't in any way accord with conventional, straightforward economics. And so you're referring then more to the risk-taking as causing the crash, or is it an underconsumption thesis? Uh, well, under the underconsumption under thesis is an international thesis. Mm -hmm. In other words, nations like China uh, don't consume enough of their own goods or import enough goods. Uh, therefore, they send capital our way, which makes it readily available at low interest rates for our consumers. We, in turn, relatively speaking, consume too much compared to the size of the economy, or we did before mm -hmm. 2007, based on debt. But all of this goes together. Wall Street took this money and amplified, built a pyramid out of it, uh, and took on much more risk. It issued securities that were significantly riskier than by and large, they claim they were, than the ratings agencies claim they were. And then so-called sophisticated investors understood. That led to a huge layer of debt. And once that unwound, it led to a very serious recession, a collapse in demand, nobody willing to make loans, or if they were, nobody willing to take loans because the consumer was underwater, and so were a lot of businesses. Right. And so just in terms of the risk-taking, does Dodd-Frank do enough to correct those problems? Well, you know, Dodd-Frank is repeatedly watered down these days. It does some things correctly. The things it does correctly, it may not do enough of, partly because of the watering down. There's several big issues, and it's a very complex bill. One of the big issues is whether there are adequate capital requirements on banks. That is, should they keep enough money there on which, and then lend once they've got enough capital behind those loans or other investments they make. 
they clearly have not, and I think that's an important issue. And I don't think Dodd-Frank has dealt with that adequately yet. It's kind of thrown it to international bankers in Basel to decide on that. Another issue, and there are a lot, once you say the words Dodd-Frank, you open up a big uh, Pandora's box, so to speak. Right. Uh, another issue are the derivatives, all those credit default swaps, uh, right. which were so central to the risk-taking uh, that went on, and the so-called risk-hedging that went on. People use those derivatives to hedge their risks, therefore they can make certain kinds of risky investments. In fact, those uh, uh, hedges did not work. It was not clear people could meet their obligations. The prices were not transparent. They were obscure. And Dodd-Frank does something about that, but it's provided lots of exemptions. The most important thing I think we have to keep in mind is Dodd-Frank should not be merely trying to prevent the next crisis. It should be reorienting Wall Street in a way that it does what it should have done and sometimes did, and I emphasize sometimes, historically, which is to channel our precious savings into productive investment. Does Dodd-Frank, is it really geared to do that? Not really. It's not cutting risks satisfactorily. It's not changing incentives to make speculative, bad speculative investments uh, sufficiently, in my view. People, with my general political view, some people disagree with me. But I think uh, the, bigger, the bigger issues are not being met by Dodd-Frank. Before I, I do want to ask you what specific policies you think would be most useful. Um, but before I get into that, I want to discuss what you think the role of academics might be in assisting this movement. Well, there are all kinds of academics. Some of them I would keep away from, <laughs> like the guys who just won the Nobel Prize. Uh, <laughs> um, I think academics can be begin to put some substance behind the greed issue. I wrote a book called Age of Greed. I actually do think greed in the sense of, of extreme self-interest and violation of community interest was one of the core problems. Uh, I think academics can begin to show how excessive risk-taking, as we already discussed, led to a situation which created a housing bubble, and then when the bubble, housing bubble burst, the financial securities that were based on those housing prices burst. And that almost invariably leads to recession, usually a severe recession, and history suggests a long recession. Academics can help a lot in talking about how to get out of this recession. Now, academics disagree. This is not, uh, economics is not a science where there is broad central agreement uh, on certain, uh, not, there is some broad central agreement on some things, but not others. So some economists will say we have to spend our way out of this. Right. Other economists will say we have to cut government spending. Well, I think cut government spending people are entirely wrong. I think the empirical evidence and the theoretical evidence, uh, modeling suggests they are wrong. I do think we have to spend our way out of this, uh, especially because it's a recession that's been brought on by a huge and, and a stagnation that's continued due to a huge overhang of debt. Your colleague at the Roosevelt Institute, Mike Consul, had made three suggestions uh, to consider in terms of concrete uh, policy changes that maybe could address some of the issues that our movement is concerned with. And I believe his were uh, canceling the debt, um, holding, the, holding Wall Street accountable, having some criminal prosecutions, and a financial transaction tax. I wondered if you agreed with those, if you, had any, if you had, would have different priorities, and what you thought about them. Well, uh, uh, law professor Frank Partnoy and I are just publishing a piece in the New York Review of Books calling for more prosecutions. I think Americans are confused and angry, and they sit around and say, you mean there were so few prosecutions because these people really didn't do anything wrong or violated the law or was unethical? They merely made big, heavy-handed mistakes on which they made a lot of money? Is that what this was about? I think the lack of sufficient prosecution is suggesting that. 
So I think we need some real clarity there. But I, I have a rather long list of suggestions, <laughs> but let me do them in order, okay? Yes. First, we have to spend our way out of this recession. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't be talking about tax increases yet, and I'm sure Mike uh, agrees mm -hmm. with that. We have to spend on what? Well, we have to just spend for the moment. Mm -hmm. Expanded unemployment insurance, expanded funds to the state and local governments. Uh, spending on infrastructure now would be very useful because it's a double whammy. It builds the foundation of the economy and creates jobs. We should be spending more. Uh, we should also have a jobs program. The federal government should simply be hiring people like they did in the Depression, putting money into the economy and creating jobs, plain out hiring people. Once we get the economy back and moving again, because it's basically stalled or almost stalled at the moment, it may not sink, but it's basically stalled, then we can begin thinking about some other things. One of them is, again, very serious investment in this country, in education, in more infrastructure, in pre-K education, which we have no national institutions for to speak of, in new energy investment. We need a very serious public investment program. I'm talking not about $50 billion, which the president proposed. We're talking more in the order of $500 billion to a $1 trillion. Not necessarily all government money. It could be by priming the beginnings of a new bank. That's number one. Number two, we can pay for some of that investment by increasing taxes. We don't after we get the economy going. Should there be a financial tax? Transactions tax? Yes, because it has two benefits. We raise revenue and we begin to cut down some of the silly speculation. And maybe we should explain what a financial transaction tax is. It would be a little tax every time you, uh, you trade a commodity, you trade a stock, you trade a dividend back and forth between two people. It, we, it could be established in different ways, but they would have to pay a little tax, maybe an eighth of a point, uh, an eighth of a dollar. Uh, maybe even less, but it would begin to uh, slow speculation. Now, it's interesting. A bunch of economists, including some from mainstream economics departments, recently asked for less speculation in food commodities mm -hmm. because they're driving commodities prices of food up and down much too much, and food is such a basic need of poor countries. So that's an example. But I also think we have to completely reverse the Bush tax cuts of the early 2000s, not merely reverse them on those who are making 250000 or more. If we completely reverse them, all this talk and fear about budget deficits over the next 10 years and the rising level of debt as a percentage of GDP, doing that alone would uh, obviate, would cancel out, would do away with all those fears. If we only reversed the Bush tax cuts and went back at the tax rates of the 1990s. Now, that would mean the middle class would be paying slightly more income tax. So what? Let's get the House in order. Um, uh, I, in fact, think the, another part of this is that the concern with budget deficits and debt as a percentage of GDP is far too, uh, is far too great. But finally, uh, I don't even know if this is a final. Finally, we need the re-regulation we were talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. Seriously begins to challenge how Wall Street works. Don't they make monopoly fees on these deals they do? Is there any competition in this serious competition in this business at all? What are these trading pro uh, profits? Aren't they based on some questionable manipulative practices? and lots of information available to these people. We really haven't gotten to the core of these problems. And the immense number of conflicts of interest in these big banks. It's not, as Simon Johnson says, just because they're big. It's because they're conflicted. They sell products, uh, they sell products of their customers to the same people or to different people, and they're often conflicts of interest. If you're selling one kind of soda and you know, the other companies selling another kind of soda, they should be or can be separate companies. If we're selling, if, if uh, we're giving loans to companies and raising money for them and telling people to buy their stock 
and then try and buy options in them and commodities based on those options. Lots of conflicts of interest. And finally, can I say one more thing? Because I know. Of I'm course, here. of course. Um, perhaps the biggest thing, and you probably talked about this a lot yourself, and certainly thought about it. The public financing of elections in America could be the single biggest reform of all. The reason we have these lobbyists down there, we're, they spent $1.3 billion, by the way, in 2009 and the beginning of 2010 while Dodd-Frank was being written, $1.3 billion. But why did they spend it? The senators and congressmen didn't take it just to have a nice lunch out of these guys. They took it because they would generate campaign contributions. It's very expensive now, especially because of television, to run campaigns in America. These congressmen, rather than doing legislation and reading a couple of reports to learn something, are out there at fundraisers all the time, raising money. But worse than that, of course, it gives power to the very wealthy. Uh, if we had public financing of elections, um, it could restore democracy in one fell swoop in America. Right now, democracy in America is simply stunted. And Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Missoula yes. are filling holes in this democracy. Literally, literally, institutional holes. There was no voice for so many Americans until this movement came along. I heard you say something that sounded a lot like a Richard Koo thesis in terms of overhang of debt. Reinhardt Rogoff, Richard Koo calls it balance sheet recession. Right. Yeah. And do you think that debt cancellation or mortgage yes. restructuring? Yes. Should I should be a have part mentioned mortgage relief. I just forgot. There yeah. has to be some kind of serious mortgage relief plan. You know, I also think there should be a student loan plan, a student loan relief plan. I wouldn't mind seeing uh, all of you involved with the Occupy various locations start talking about student loan relief in a time when 20-somethings and 30-somethings just can't get jobs and will never catch up, really, on average anyway, with the people who came before them. Um, so I should not have left that out. And that was a big oversight, on, in my view, on the part of the Obama administration, not only on my part. Uh, but um, there is so much to do in the nation. But we, but, but Reinhardt and, uh, uh, and whom I think it broke up looked historically at these finan these recessions caused by financial crisis and found that they tended to be longer. Now there's been some overstatement of the conclusion, maybe by the authors themselves, uh, uh, the conclusions you can really draw from what they found because a lot of these are coincidences. Uh, you don't know which is the cause and which is the effect all the right. time. Uh, it could be those those recessions were prolonged because while they were severe, not enough was done to get out of them. They weren't just natural phenomena. But uh, uh, there is a suggestion from history and from our, our our simple analysis of current circumstances when there that when there is so much debt overhanging. A, a country, you can't get consumers and business to spend the way they would in another recession. So you need even more stimulus. Some would argue the opposite. You have to cut debt. I don't see the logic of it at all, but uh, this that's economics. Right. And so there's a demand shortfall, but a lot of the demands being held back by balance sheet problems is what you're saying, essentially. Yeah. I mean... Put it, you use the jargon I'm trying to avoid. Yes, the yes. Yeah. But yes, that's true. There is a, there is an aggregate demand shortage right. in America, an old Keynesian notion. Right. And, and uh, there is an aggregate demand shortage in the world. One of the interesting problems is when the world is so interconnected by imports and exports, can, do we have to coordinate fiscal stimulus more, so that we're all pumping together. Right. If America pumps alone, a lot of it leaks out to imports, for example. Yet a new wrinkle in the economy. Instead of dealing with all these new wrinkles, we, so many people now like to make believe they'll just go away if you somehow cut government spending and balance budgets and keep taxes low. Right. And so so because there's these balance sheet problems, debt relief really could, whether it's student loans, the mortgage crisis obviously yeah. being at the heart of it. 
If we reduce those, that would do a lot. I mean, that's essentially what we're doing and why we're staying in a demand shortfall is because we are working through this debt overhang just very slowly. Well, I think, uh, you know, you don't want to oversimplify it too much. It is a major factor in restraining consumption. Mm -hmm. We had a very deep recession and prolonged recession by any standard, however, even without debt. So we would take substantial fiscal stimulus coupled with monetary stimulus to get us out of it. I don't think the Fed alone can do this. I think it has to be coupled with serious increase in direct aggregate demand, which is what the federal government and other nations can do. Meantime, Europe is bogged down in austerity economics in places like England, Mm -hmm. obviously imposed on Greece, self-imposed by Portugal, and on. And they've had clearly very bad and rather bad results and harsh results for many of those people. I'm changing topics a little bit. Um, Ben Bernanke recently appeared before Congress and seemed to uh, indicate at least an understanding of why there would be frustration in the country. Um, And many people took that as a positive sign. Um, However, I think just a week earlier, he had spoken in Cleveland, at the Cleveland Fed, and it actually kind of endorsed uh, the Washington consensus, used it as his model with only slight modifications, um, and also seemed to indicate that he was going to consider continue with the policy uh, of price control, of keeping inflation low? Well, he's, he's been saying contradictory things. I think in his heart, wherever that is, <laughs> he actually wants to worry about inflation less. But Ben Bernanke, I think some people oversimplify the process. He is not a dictator. He's got to deal with his other board members and build consensuses. Even Alan Greenspan had to do that. After a while, Alan Greenspan got so much adulation that it turned into a power and he could really push the board around a little more. So Bernanke has inflation hawks he has to worry about. Um, So he may be playing to those. It is absurd at the moment to worry about inflation. Many people, including myself, have been saying that for two years. I remember two or two years ago, you know, the time is going by so fast. What am I saying? Three years ago? Uh, people kept saying, well, uh, inflation Hi- is coming any minute now. Yeah, hyperinflation and soaring interest, right? And John Paulson, the guy who made all that money by shorting the mortgages, remember this guy made $4 billion in one year? Yes. I think red is, fund is down 47% now. Why? Because he was betting on inflation coming back. Right. He was sure of it. And, uh, uh, you know, I had friends who were sure of it. Uh, they underestimated the severity of the problem, including the debt overhang. The best thing we could see now is a little bit of inflation. Not because, as uh, Kenneth Rogoff says, we should use it as an an objective, but because it would imply the demand is coming back. Mm -hmm. Prices are going up. And that would also have the ancillary benefit of reducing a little bit the debt overload just through inflating, uh, just through inflation. But um, uh, uh, I think it's been, you know, we often go through periods where, uh, in fact, probably more often than the other way around, where fears of inflation lead to much slower economies and stagnation and downturns uh, than any other single factor. And we uh, shouldn't be worried about it now. It's nowhere to be seen. Right. And yet it seems to be all over the first world, austerity and inflation hot seem to be ruling the day. Yeah, well, in in Europe they are. Um, uh, to some degree in the U.S. they are because President Obama joined the Republicans and said at, during the campaign, at the last campaign, um, it's government spending that's the concern. I think the austerity economics have something to do with the, not inflation specifically, but another fear that can often be irrational, which is deficits. We're spending more than we take in. Now, that's ultimately people claim, will claim is related to inflation down the road. Too much demand for too few goods. The monetarists or their newer age disciples say too much money, uh, chase too few goods. But um, we're a very long way from that. 
somehow or other, the British people and Cameron think that because they have high levels of debt compared to GDP, they are therefore, by definition, unmanageable. And if we cut our spending and make them manageable, it will work. Now, there is a big dispute, as you seem to be a very, uh, uh, very aware of many of these issues and probably educated in. There was an empirical dispute among economists about this. Mm -hmm. Economists would say, yes, austerity economics can work. And they, you know, a couple of people from Harvard, which, by the way, is a rather conservative economics department. Is this, this is the Alessandra... Alessina and, and... Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, that work. Uh, you know, by and large argued for that. There was some other work by government institutions and other economists. Mm -hmm. Yet, that, those studies seem to be highly simplified. A couple of new studies from the International Monetary Fund, no hotbed of progressives, <laughs> enough, as the people in Asia from 1997 and 1998, have done very good studies to show that when you really properly measure this and you isolate austerity economics undertaken when time, when the economy is weak, which is the case now, uh, they don't work. They make matters worse. So the right. empirical evidence is pretty clear that austerity economics in this kind of environment will make matters worse. And, and, the, uh, and the strong economies, and particularly Germany and some of the Nordic companies, are imposing this on, as you know, the periphery in Europe, in particular Greece, but maybe Italy, Spain, and, and uh, so forth. Just like the IMF imposed it on the East Asian countries in 1997, and it caused, it was very cruel to the average man. Right? It's quite extraordinary. I think Americans didn't quite get it. I think we're starting to get it now because we are suffering some also. Uh, it, uh, it's a very, you, you're really putting enormous pressure on the Greek government by punishing the Greek people. And in fact, to some degree, the Greeks were led into this by an EU who didn't have a sufficient adjustment process. And Germany, and uh, to a lesser degree, France, and some of the Nordic countries should be acknowledging that they benefited greatly by Greece's overspending, because Greece was buying their goods. The euro, the value of the euro, was not really properly reflecting the competitive changes in Europe over 10 years. Yeah, and even in, even in addition to um, the problems, the policy, the, what we're talking about is the expa expansionary austerity thesis uh, seems to have no empirical support, is what you're suggesting. And Paul Krugman's even gone a step further, or at least flirted with it. Richard Koo has certainly said it outright. That in fact austerity also won't even hurt the won't even help your fiscal position. That it's going to hurt your long-term fiscal position as well. In this, yeah, that, that, that depends on assumptions, and I think probably there's empirical evidence where that actually occurred. It depends on the assumptions you make about multipliers or and you know lack of multipliers, uh, right. reverse multipliers, and so forth. But right. it's certainly feasible to me. And I also, have a stronger right. view, a stronger view of that, but we need not talk about that. I, I think there probably tends to be a persistent lack of aggregate demand. And we, and the mainstream economists in America uh, uh, have consistently underestimated and ignored the problems of insufficient demand and the, and, and the benefits of demand-led growth in their models of, even of long-term growth. Right. Um, is there anything that you would want, anything further that you'd want to add in terms of um, where you'd like, think, you know, just to the members of the movement? Yeah, th that I think you're right. That a nation that has a, pro you know, that has a problem caused by, really largely caused by fat cats on Wall Street, uh, starts talking about cutting Social Security and Medicare for the elderly. Right. And um, and Medicaid, for that matter, for the poor, uh, to solve fiscal problems, and doesn't talk about a transactions tax for Wall Street or a significant increase uh, of income taxes for higher income people. That's a nation that's lost its way. Uh, I had a debate recently about cutting Medicare and Medicaid and, um, and Social Security. It'll be on PBS, I'm sure, in a station coming to you in NPR. And I'm just appalled by this kind of thing. And what I reminded the people in the audience was that we are 
almost the lowest taxed nation, rich nation in the world. Currently, income tax revenues run at 15% of GDP. Overall, including all taxes, we pay a low proportion of our income compared to other nations in taxes. This is not, we cannot compare ourselves to the 19th century. This is a complex society, a very complex economy. Some people suffer as the economy changes. I believe we need more income in a stagnating wage environment, and wages have been stagnating for several decades now, for men in particular. Uh, they've grown for women, but really not rapidly, despite occasionally I even hear progressives say they've grown rapidly. They really haven't, um, not by historical standards. So we have a lot of room to raise taxes. My, here's my bottom line, okay? We don't have a problem in America if we raise taxes and invest properly in this country again, public investment. And that will bring in private investment and good, productive, long-term risk-taking, not another round of mortgage investment or high-tech fantasies like the late 1990s. But we do have a health care problem. And 10 and 15 years from now, Medicare and Medicaid will cost too much for America, given the return in health outcomes. That we have to think about. And I wish these bright minds who are dedicating themselves so strenuously to reducing the near-term uh, government spending. And what I mean by near-term is over the next 10 years. I wish they'd put their minds and their political efforts towards reforming the health care system, where some parts of our economy will have to take a hit, health insurance companies in particular, and maybe health care providers. But that's America's biggest domestic problem. The war machine, we'll leave that for another time. <laughs> um, and, well, the health care is a, you know, I think Kenneth Arrow wrote a paper maybe 50 years ago suggesting that uh, health, you know, privatized health care is going to result in market failure. And there have been, I guess my question is, do you think it's a political problem or an economic problem that we've been unable to deal with health care, the environment? Um, well, you know, at some you know, do I think these problems are solvable. I don't know enough about the environmental problems. I don't know the cost of global warming. I don't know the cost of reducing it. Uh, but there are solutions for most of our social problems. Are there? Uh, there is a solution for our health care system. Right. Medicare for all is a solution, for right. example, for our health. You know, I, I, all, I've all argued in favor of that and was appalled when President Obama said he would like to raise the eligibility age from 65 to 67, or he agreed for a while with the Republicans, and he's uh, uh, gratifyingly reversed that. He does not agree to that at, at the moment, anyway. Uh, there are other problems that may be far more intractable. How do we really get better educational results for a large part of the poor population. That's a tough problem. That's a problem that politics alone, good politics alone, may not solve. I do believe it can make it better. But it, will requ it may require resources we don't have. It may require whole large-scale uh, changes in the way our social lives work. Uh, that's a problem that... As I, as I already said, may be intractable, and we really have to think very hard about that. The causes of poverty, those are some big problems. Problems we're talking about now, funding Social Security, dealing with health care, those are political problems. If the country wanted to, they could solve them, and the, big, the easiest way to solve them is raising taxes and putting in more controls and recognizing that some things can't work according to market principles, which is what Kenneth Arrow was saying. I didn't even like the word market failure because, uh, you know, it, it's prominent in Kenneth Arrow's work, Paul Samuelson, going way back, Robert Sola, and modern-day economists like Joe Stiglitz. But, it, of course, health care can't work <laughs> by market principles. 
how the heck do we know what we need healthcare wise? Do we want to take a one even a million chance of having the disease if somebody gives us a test to prevent it? So these are significant serious issues. And we, the fact is, going back to mortgages, we buy a house two, three times a year, maybe. How the heck can we become expert in dealing with these darn mortgages? They're so ridiculous and complex. And who has the time or desire to deal with them? So you need some protection there. You don't need controls there. Well, in some areas you may, but you certainly need some protection and some need to make it simpler, which was one of the central points uh, of Elizabeth Warren's um, uh, um, case that she always made. We need some level of standardization so, and simplification so that people can uh, deal with mortgage products. But those are problems we can solve. There are a couple of problems that are harder to solve. The problems we're talking about right now, they are solvable. I did want to finish on that point that you were just making. Essentially what you're saying is there are some difficult problems, but most of the problems that currently exist are very solvable. We know how to solve them, and it's really a political problem. Is that what I understand you to be saying? Yes, yeah, it's basically a political problem, but uh, it's a big political problem. Right, that's what this that's movement what is about. Uh, that's you know this about the organization of the EU. Uh, uh, these are big political problems, and we haven't had great economic management. And you have uh, the head of Britain talking about austerity economics working. It's nonsense. When the president, Democratic president of the United States, at least for a while, believes the big problem was government spending when we had a job crisis, that's a problem. He has turned, I think. His attitudes have turned. I should point out one thing, that You know, the president's jobs per budget would alleviate all uh, the basic problems of debt as a percentage of GDP for the next 10 years. It would leave debt in the neighborhood of 70 or 72 percent, and even moderately conservative economists think that would be adequate. So should, we should recognize that. On the other hand, most of his budget uh, plan is based on um, spending cuts, not revenue increases, not tax increases. In fact, a greater proportion of his is based on spending cuts than even Simpson Bowles' plans for balancing the budget. His uh, budget balancing commission that he unfortunately created some time ago that lent credibility and created too much fear about our budget deficit problem. You seem to have been um, noticeably touched by going down and visiting our movement in Zuccotti Park, and I just wondered if you could talk a bit about why. Well, you know, we went down there. We, uh, when I was invited, uh, I should have sent you a piece I published today, maybe. I don't think you got it. Um, when I was first invited, which was two Sundays ago, it seems an age ago, yes. people were afraid for me. And I actually called a lawyer before I went down. Because the day before, seven, the 700 young people, or not all young people, were arrested on that march on the Brooklyn Bridge. Right. I didn't quite know what to expect, but I felt it was my obligation. This is why I do things. And I ran into Joe Stiglitz, and we did that teaching. turned out the young people were extremely courteous, extremely eager, uh, um, uh, thirsty for information, thirsty for confirmation of what they felt or explanation of why they felt the way they did. So it was touching. Uh, and I think maybe Joe and I had a very small part in showing the more established world mm -hmm. that it was okay to go there. Right. You know, that these people were really well-meaning. Some of them, many of them are very bright. Some of them are very well-educated. I mean, the other day I had a little meeting with a physician, a PhD, another PhD person. Uh, so, yes, I was... Uh, a touch, but I think what is most touching is the response around the nation and the build-up in Zuccotti Park, because it's really hit a nerve and filled, as I put it, an institutional hole in America. The Democratic Party wasn't answering the call. Congress wasn't answering it. The media, oh my gosh, the media, uh, you know, there were always exceptions, but they weren't answering this call of frustration and anger and confusion. And these young people, including yourself, 
have brought attention to that and in turn have forced Congress to answer to them to some degree, at least forced Congress and the media to begin to appreciate these problems more. So we see somewhat more discussion of issues we never saw before. The next steps I am not sure about. I worry a little bit about it. Should there be explicit demands? Should there be an explicit policy agenda? Uh, what happens, of course, when it gets cold here in New York City? What happens as this keeps going and there are more opportunities for conflict with the authorities? I think it was great that Mayor Bloomberg said they could stay as long as they care to stay. There is an end point there because it gets darn cold here in Manhattan. <laughs> February or January, and I'm not sure they'll be allowed to put up tents with ovens. I'm not, not ovens, but heaters. Right. Uh, there may be some restriction on that. I was told. I'm not sure of that. Right. They, they have no shelters at this point, right? They're not allowed to keep shelter up. I think they may not be. Um, right. We'll see if they can negotiate about that. I don't know what their plans are. But, yeah, I'm really touched by it all. And, in fact, I went... It is remarkable how much it changed in one week. It's just remarkable how much it changed day by day. Yes. And now, you know, people were, my friends were afraid for me to go down there. Now you go down there and parents are bringing their children. There's food, all kinds of volunteer food, all kinds of volunteer clothing. Uh, you know, there's a medic area for medical emergencies. Uh, there's a sanitation crew, pretty well organized. Um, uh, and it just keeps growing, and I, apparently I'm told there's going to be an international event on October 15th. I myself will be in Dublin and then going to Paris by that day, but um, uh, I look forward to the results of that. And in fact, I look forward at some point for your people to begin developing channels with Congress, because we do have democratic institutions here. They've been sterilized, paralyzed, stunted, choose your verb, and maybe they can be opened up. Well, I want to thank you so much for being so willing to share your expertise, uh, you know, over and over with our movement and for being such an ally. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you, and I'm glad we were able to connect with this newfangled technology. <laughs> the old stuff by now, but it's still fairly new to me. Yeah, so we're going to do what we can to get this out to all of the hundreds of Occupy movements that are in smaller towns. Well, great. I'm glad to hear that. And yeah. uh, that's what they say this new technology is about. So exactly. Let's use Take so care. And I hope you encourage your colleagues to uh, also um, engage with us. I will. I Thank appreciate you. it. Take Thank care you. now. Thank you. Bye-bye.